right now. Educator, composer, pianist, and writer, author of international bestseller, The World Peace Diet, published in 16 languages, peace activist and vegan for 37 years, recipient of the Courage of Conscience Award and the Empty Cages Award, PhD from UC Berkeley, focusing on educating intuition and altruism, creator of the World Peace Diet training programs, has taught college courses in philosophy, humanities, mythology, comparative religion, former Zen monk and Dharma master in the Korean Zen tradition, co-founder of the Worldwide Prayer Circle for Animals, currently conducting a music, art, and education ministry with his spouse, Madeline, a visionary artist from Switzerland. Everybody, ladies and gentlemen, San Francisco, give it up for Dr. Will Tuttle! Thank you, thanks. <laughs> All right. Thank you, and uh, it's, an honor <laughs> it's an honor to be here at the San Francisco Veg Fest. Let's have a big hand for San Francisco Veg Fest, one of the great Veg Fests, everyone. Thank you. And I'd like to, um, also just in the beginning here, I want to make sure I, I uh, honor my wonderful spouse, Madeline. Let's have a hand for Madeline, the artist. She's right there. <laughs> and these are her um, paintings of animals behind me. So I feel that any words that I can say uh, are never nearly as articulate as they could be when we look into the eyes of these beautiful animals whose uh, fate is really in our hands and how do we treat them and I think they're pleading with us really to awaken out of the cultural trance of exploitation and oppression that they're born into which is really caused by human uh, habits so uh, please if you get tired of listening to me you can always look at the paintings and <laughs> get inspiration from that so thank you Madeline so much for all you do and uh, yeah so I just would like to um, talk a little bit about some of the uh, main ideas in the world peace diet and then also what I see is happening today uh, in the movement to liberate not only animals but also human beings from the slavery of animal agriculture. I'll just mention at the beginning, and I want to just ask at the beginning, how many of you have actually read the, the World Peace Diet? I'll be talking about some, so some of you, quite a few of you have, most of you haven't, it looks like. So I'll talk about some of those ideas. We're just leaving actually a week from today, we're flying out of Oakland to London and we're starting a two and a half month lecture tour. Uh, we'll, we'll be speaking in, in uh, Europe. Switzerland and uh, in Spain and England and then flying I think it's the first ever major vegan tour to help veganize India so we'll be going to India and public and speaking in uh, 10 different uh, cities in India it's a you know it's an amazing country I mean that's really the birthplace of vegetarianism uh, but what I hear from the organizers of the tours that they're they're just not that interested in veganism yet they, they uh, but hopefully we'll make some dents there and then from there to Taiwan and China for another uh, few weeks, I guess about a month there. And it's great to see actually, we're very fortunate I think to travel uh, to both Eastern and Western Europe and to Asia and, these, and Africa and, uh, and Middle East and other places to see how uh, the vegan movement is just exploding. I mean, it's really growing. There's vegan restaurants, you know, anywhere, everywhere, South Africa, Dubai, all these different places and uh, vegan meetup groups and people are awakening out of uh, this uh, obsolete mentality of dominating and oppressing animals for so-called food and uh, so it's important I think to remember that we're part of a, a really important and fast-growing movement here so um, anyway this has been translated into 16 languages and it's really great to see uh, the energy that is still carrying and we have the 10th anniversary edition just came out there's another book for those of you who are interested we have a few copies of the circles of compassion which is about the subtext is essays connecting issues of social justice and there's a, a intersectionality is a movement on the interconnection between our routine abuse and violence towards animals which is referred to essentially as speciesism the, the mentality of human superiority and the right for us to dominate and exploit other animals animals and uh, and the connections between that and racism and sexism and heterosexism and ableism and classism and the other ways that we dominate and exploit each other and how the mentality at a deep level is connected it's very interesting so there's 29 authors that I chose to um, to contribute to this besides myself I think a lot of the roots are in the world peace diet but this is 
I think a good book for anyone who wants to just dive into social justice at a deeper level and understanding that. And then finally, this book just came out a few months ago. It's called Your Inner Islands, The Keys to Intuitive Living. And that's basically about connecting with our intuition. And I think that's very important. You know, we have two ways of knowing, I think. This is well understood by all societies. And when I got my PhD at Berkeley back in the 80s, I was able to, do, to actually write my, my PhD dissertation on educating intuition in adults. And the, actually, the dissertation was nominated as the best dissertation at Berkeley that year, but you would not want to read it. It was a very dry <laughs> academic dissertation. But so this is a book that gives exercises and teachings on connecting with our inner wisdom. You know, because these two ways of knowing, one is logic and rationality and intellect and analysis, and those are wonderful, helpful tools. Uh, but I think we all know in our bones that there's other ways we have of knowing at a deeper level, perhaps uh, intuition or revelation or inspiration, a deeper way of knowing. And I think really in many ways, some people do move from the typical uh, standard American diet, the standard way of eating and living, uh, through purely rational means, right? I think that's great. If people kind of, you know, are rational and they think, well, it doesn't make sense. It's, it's uh, devastating to our health. It's harming our environment. It's devastating to animals. It's a rational thing to do, right? But if we were so rational, I mean, then everybody would go vegan. <laughs> I mean, it's very obvious, right? I mean, the, the rational argument is absolutely on every level a, a, a no-brainer, uh, but in many ways people resist rationality but I think at a deeper level I, most people I think actually go vegan because something in our heart opens up one day it's just like suddenly it's like aha I get it you know we, we see either we you know sometimes it's a, a very quick thing sometimes it takes uh, many steps but we realize and something at a deeper level opens up and I think this intuition that we have is our greatest ally. It's a, an inner knowing that we can learn to trust and connect with to guide us in our lives to live our own life, not to be a bio-robot just fulfilling a program that is not in our best interest. And I think this is very important to understand. A lot of people ask me, actually, um, you know, if you're on an elevator and you only have a, one sentence to deliver to people uh, to help them go vegan, right, or to help them to move in that direction, what would that sentence be? And this is the sentence, I think, in, in your own words, but the basic idea is this. I'm so grateful that I discovered that the only reason I was eating animal foods all those years was because I was just following orders. And now I don't do it anymore, and it's great. You, pl you say that, and you have just planted a depth charge in the person's consciousness because it's so powerful. Gandhi talked about satyagraha. You know what satyagraha means? Literally, it means truth power, the power of truth. See, how many people can we actually change? One. You know, I can change myself. That's a great thing. We can change ourselves. If I come along and I, and I, and I say, okay, I'm going to change you, right? You're going to say, all right, I'm going to run the other way. You're not going to change me. Now, if somebody wanted to, came up to me and said they wanted to change me, I'd say, you know, I don't want to be changed. Leave me alone. I'm okay. You know, I don't want to be converted. So, you know, the whole idea, I think, with our movement is that it's important for us to realize that when we just live the best we can, what veganism is pointing to, which is kindness and respect for other living beings and for ourselves and for our earth, when we live that deeply, then our words and actions are congruent, right? Then we're, when, when we speak, then people feel it. And I think even though we cannot change other people, we can do something though. We can plant seeds, right? We can plant seeds that will blossom in their consciousness. And when they blossom, th those pr people will change. And so I think this is really, in, in a sense, the, um, the, 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 the frontier uh, of our movement is for us to bring our message, which is a very important message, the vegan message, and to do it creatively, but to really base it on taking responsibility for transforming ourselves so that we're living this message in the nitty gritty of our lives and we're in our relationships with our, with our spouse and our parents and kids and our coworkers and colleagues so that, so that what we're saying is in alignment. And this is what Satyagraha is all about. It's, it, Gandhi said it very well. He said, my life is my message. You know, to live our life so that everything we're doing is an expression of kindness and compassion for the, the larger holes with which we are embedded. And so the Satyagraha idea, I think, when, I, when we just 
connect with that sentence was that I said, I'm so grateful that I discovered that the only reason I was eating animal foods was because I was just following orders. That's a key point. And when we leave here and we go out into the world and we see people going into McDonald's or Burger King or going into the uh, grocery stores and taking out their wallets, right, and paying for meat, dairy products, and eggs, there's only one reason anyone does that. And it's because they're following orders. These are orders that are injected into us without our permission by people that are enormously powerful, our parents and teachers, our doctors, our ministers or rabbis, you know, everybody, our neighbors and friends, people we trust completely, absolutely completely. And so we're following orders. These orders get injected early on and it's extremely difficult for us to question those. It goes back to like a tribal mentality. You know, if, you, you know, if, you were, if we were part of a tribe and we said to the tribe, I'm not gonna eat your food anymore, that's unthinkable. That's like saying, okay, I'm gonna go off in the wilderness and die by myself, right? So when someone comes into the room and says, I'm vegan, Everybody at a deep level goes, uh-oh, this is trouble. I don't want to hear about this, you know. <laughs> He's not part of our tribe. He's from some other strange tribe over there, right? And so, so we got to understand, it's a, in a way, it's a miracle anyone goes vegan because we, we really have to, it's a very, we have to actually connect and go against so much cultural programming. And so... Uh, but to understand this, that we're, we're only eating animal foods because of this program, this cultural program. And anthropologists understand this. If you study anthropology, it's very well understood that the primary way that any society transmits its values from generation to generation is through, the, is through rituals. And the main ritual in any society are meals. When people get together and eat food together, we're not just eating food. What are we eating besides food? We're eating attitudes, we're eating values, we're eating norms and mores, we're eating, it's, but no one talks about that. And, and what are these attitudes? I mean, they're toxic. The food is toxic, really. I mean, I, there's this great saying by Dr. John McDougall, you know, and I, he's right. He says, you know, that he talks about the standard American diet and he talks about children, how they're eating these foods that make them sick, you know, and have runny noses and earaches and colic and tonsillitis and appendicitis and acne and all on and on and on. And he says the pain and suffering that are inflicted on, on, parent, on children by their parents is so intense by their by their food that they're you know giving them to eat is so intense that if the parents inflicted that much pain and suffering on their kids by hitting them with a stick they'd be thrown in jail <laughs> right so but the thing that i think is important to understand is that yes you know they're well-meaning parents we're just eating what we our, what our parents told us to eat and so forth and it does cause suffering on many levels and it kind of creates the foundation for diabetes and obesity and osteoporosis and liver disease and kidney disease and breast prostate and colon cancer and strokes and all this other stuff later on but the attitudes that we're actually eating are even worse I think even in terms of causing suffering to us than the foods what are the attitudes that are what are the attitudes that are implicit in sitting down at a table where people are eating the flesh and secretions of horribly abused a animals what are some of the attitudes the attitudes essentially are there's many I mean but I'll, I'll just maybe emphasize three or four of them one of them is essentially an attitude of disconnectedness you know the basic message in every meal is do not make the connection don't make the obvious connections don't just don't connect stay shallow don't look deeply don't feel deeply don't listen deeply just trust the authorities just eat what we tell you to eat because if we started to think about this you can you imagine you know tomorrow morning people are sitting around a, a, a breakfast table somewhere and they're having oatmeal and some bacon and maybe some orange juice and whatever and someone says hmm, this bacon's pretty good um, I wonder what she was like you can't that's like totally taboo <laughs> you do not ask that question what do you mean what she was like you know get out of here you know that's not a she that's an it that's just a piece of bacon no but I was wondering what she was like you know what, what her what her life was like before she was killed and you know no 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 we don't think about that so we got to realize that our whole society I mean, think about this deeply in our entire culture has been indoctrinated at the most powerful way possible through rituals the most powerful ritual in any society are meals to just basically shut down not feel desensitized numb our actual feelings our intelligence to reduce our intelligence and to just follow the program because Intelligence is, is uh, it's understood. I mean, intelligence basically is the ability to make connections that are relevant, right? That's what intelligence is, to make connections, like, aha, you know, and, and, to and so we're, we're every meal is teaching us to not make connections, to actually disconnect. 
And so when, you happen, when that happens on an individual level, that reduces our intelligence as an individual, our actual intelligence. When you do that to an entire society, you're, you're dumbing down the entire culture, and, but it's very advantageous to a wealthy elite to have this happen, right? I mean, it's very advantageous if you, if you own a, you know, huge pharmaceutical industries, chemical industries, uh, so-called defense industries, uh, and, and uh, other the, 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 what I call the military, industrial, meat, medical, pharmaceutical, media, banking complex, you know, the, that, the complex, right? It's very advantageous to have people who will just buy whatever is advertised to them very obediently, believe the official stories about these products, believe the official stories about the, the so-called news uh, that we're hearing about it's all it's all most of it is all lies but we, we learn through these meal rituals to simply believe what we're told to believe to not look deeply to trust and dairy in itself I mean think about what dairy is it's actually uh, the underlying message is that you've, you've, you don't grow up I mean just stay an infant your entire life just you know be at the breast of someone else and get your sustenance and just it's this infantilization of an entire society where we just blindly trust the authorities to tell us what to do and what is real so what veganism is at its core it's questioning the official stories in our society as they are uh, conveyed to us through the mass media and through our uh, relationships with our parents and so forth and it's questioning those same stories in our own thinking in our own mentality. See, this is, the, this is what I mean by the inner work we have to do. I think to be effective, I've been a vegan for 37 years, but I think I'm still learning every day in, in understanding because what I discovered really over the years is that animal agriculture, not only the, the, is the food toxic and the attitudes, but it's like it colonizes our, our consciousness so that we think in a certain way. The language, the habits, the goals, the, um, the images that we, that, we, that we have internalized are all part of the herding culture. So we have to understand that we live in a herding culture. That's a fundamental thing. We think of a herding culture as some culture you know, far away, long ago, where people stood around with crooks and poked at sheep and goats, right? That's not us. We have a, a modern, computerized, industrialized, urbanized society. No. We live in a herding culture today. It's just that the herding has been industrialized and computerized much to the detriment of the animals. They suffer worse than they, you can imagine. I mean, they're hyper-confined in stinking sheds where they never see the light of day. They're in, artificially impregnated. They're horribly abused and mutilated and so forth. And it's all industrialized but, and it's hidden away. Madeline and I lived in a, a rolling home for 17 years traveling around North America and we saw basically most of North America has been completely um, enslaved to monocropping. Uh, you know what monocropping is? is where you only grow one crop, like genetically engineered corn and soy and alfalfa and other crops. Enormously toxic and devastating. Birds and bees and butterflies and fishes are all just destroyed. Wildlife is killed. And then you have certain animals, cows, pigs, and chickens and fishes that are uh, you don't see them. They're stuck away in these stinking sheds where they never get out except once to come out and, and, and have their throats slit. You know, that's basically it. This is what we've, this is the kind of society we've created. And so we have this, this herding society that's industrialized, so we're not aware of it. And we don't realize that the attitudes that we are all essentially um, thrown into that you know these attitudes are injected into us or projected into us by our upbringing are even more toxic than actual animal agriculture so in the world peace diet I, you know there's there's many aspects that I'd like to talk about um, today uh, I won't be able to cover all of them but just a little bit is the, the this outer uh, devastation environmentally into our society into our health but really more importantly the inner uh, destruction and the, the good news in all of this which I think it's very important to remember is that even though animal agriculture is really bad news that you know hurting animals is bad news because it's so wasteful of, of air quality of soil of petroleum of water it's destabilizing our climate it's we're cutting down rainforests at an acre per second right now in order to grow soybeans to feed to imprison cows pigs chickens and fishes we're overfishing the oceans the oceans are literally dying oceanographers are saying basically it's over for the oceans because the demand for fish is so vast we're not just catching fish to feed to us to eat we're, we, scientists discovered a long time ago that if you 
enrich, it's called enriching the feed of cows and pigs and chickens with fish meal uh, that it's profitable. They give more milk and they fatten up more quickly. So fish are being fed to cows and pigs and chickens uh, in a completely unsustainable level. And this perversion of, of feeding animals that are basically plant-based beings, right? They don't, they're not, have any of you seen cows trying to catch fish? <laughs> anybody, have you seen cows trying to, you know, go into a stream and try to catch fish? No, have anybody seen that? No, but cows are eating enormous quantities of fish, close to what we're eating, because the, the fish meal is, is added to their, uh, to their feed, and it makes them very sick. You know, they, they get E. coli, which is making us sick. It's from eating grain and eating fish and eating cows. They're eating other, you know, animals too, like, like chickens and, and pigs and they're eating the, the chicken litter or the feces of these animals. So this whole system works to concentrate physical toxins to the detriment of our environment. All of it ends up back in the environment, right? And the drug companies, they're the ones, I've discovered in, in 37 years of, of vegan activism that are great, the people that are most opposed to veganism, you would think it would be the fast food industry, the meat industry, the dairy industry. Is it? No, it's the pharmaceutical industry. They really hate this. I mean, because the pharmaceutical industry is, is who makes the, they, there's over 10,000 different drugs and hormones and chemicals that the pharmaceutical industry markets just to be eaten and, and put on to these animals, the cows and pigs and chickens. They're drugged. You know, it, it's totally, it's, uh, you know, they don't, it's not a voluntary vaccination, right? It's involuntary vaccination. <laughs> it's what they do to them, they do to us, you know? So it's, it's this, this, they have to take all these drugs and then people eat that stuff and they get the diseases that come from eating meat, dairy products and eggs. They get hot, you know, the, the, the biggest selling drugs, Lipitor and, and so forth, are for people who eat animal foods. And so this is a huge profit. So the profits for the pharmaceutical industry from feeding drugs to animals uh, agribusiness and then to the people who eat those uh, those animals and then um, besides the drugs for the physical illnesses that come from eating animal foods drugs for diabetes and heart conditions and cancer and so forth the third main type of profits that come to the pharmaceutical industry from animal agriculture is does anyone know what it is it's drugs for for psychological illness so this is the th what I'm saying is essentially this basic teaching is as you sow, so shall you reap. You know, what we do to others comes back to us. We force hunger onto others. We force uh, hunger uh, and, and um, misery and violence onto others. And we wonder why we have pharmaceutical industry having massive profits going every, every year for drugs. For what? What do these animals go through? They go through uh, panic anxiety, chronic pain, uh, depression, insomnia. These are the biggest selling drugs are for those conditions in human beings. Insom insomnia, depression, chronic pain, and, and so forth. So, so we're, we're inflicting on these beings who are vulnerable in our hands exactly the conditions that we're experiencing. We force them into osteoporosis. We force them into obesity. They're sold by the pound. I mean, that's all they work on all day. You know, whole armies of scientists to try to figure out through lighting schedules, through breeding, through feeding, and all this thing, to fatten animals as quickly as possible, right? We have chickens now. I remember just a, maybe five or 10 years ago, they got it down to uh, four to six weeks, 42 days, a chicken is, comes out of an egg and within 42 days, she's slaughtered. I mean, this is incredible. It used to be like they were, you know, six months old. They got it down to 42 days. Now they've got it down to like 35 days, right? I mean, they're trying to get it, you know, faster and faster. And they're, they're so obese, their legs break under them, basically. And so we, we, we spend all this money and energy to try to make other beings get obese. And what do we have happening to us? We have an obesity epidemic, right? I mean, as you sow, you reap. And so we have to understand that if we have any yearning for peace and freedom and justice and equality in our society, what, what's the best way to, to actually attain that? It's to give that, right? This is the, the basic teaching. If you, if you distill the wisdom of all the world religions into one sentence, it would be something like this. Whatever you want for yourself, give that to others. And this is it. We know that when we hear that, we go, yep, that's it. You know, if I want to be loved, what's the best way to be loved? To be loving. If I want to be abundant, what's the best way to be abundant? To be generous. If I want to be free, what's the best way to be free? To let others be free. As soon as we imprison others or steal from them or harm them, what, what happens? We hurt ourselves more than we ever hurt them. And yet we know, every one of us in here knows, every, we all know, 
Animals are not things. They're not just sacks of cement. There's a bee. How many of you have, at some point in your life, had a companion animal, like a dog or a cat? Or, yeah, so you know. I don't have to tell you. When you look into the eyes of your, of your dog or a companion animal that's with you, you know there's a being in there. And she has interests that are as important to her as my interests are to me. And that she has uh, the capacity to suffer psychologically and physically and emotionally and socially and so forth. If, if I just stick her into a closet and shut the door and she has to live in her own feces, she would suffer the way I would. I mean, it would be terrible. And maybe even worse because she can't maybe dis discursively rationalize about it. So we're inflicting, you know, I used to say we're killing 75 million animals every day for food in the United States alone. And that's, that's true, but that's a, actually I've discovered that's a gross underestimate. Even though our minds can hardly imagine killing 75 million animals every day, we have an industrialized killing machine that is accomplishing that. And it only does it for one reason because we feed it, we, gen we vote for it. You know, these, this vote, when we take out our wallets, these votes definitely get counted. I've given up on the other votes at this point. I don't know who counts those <laughs> votes. <right? laughs> Whatever, you know. But these votes really get counted. I and mean, we pay for something. That's why it's so great to come out here and see uh, vegan businesses just g blooming like mushrooms after the rain. You know, we have vegan businesses of all kinds growing, 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 growing. So the, this is the whole idea. Buckminster Fuller was brilliant, I think, in, in certain ways. And he, one of the things he said, I think, is very true. He said, you know, if you have a system that is violent and abusive and devastating. He said, if you try to fight against it and knock it down, very often you get, it'll hit you back. You know? He said, the best way is to create an alternative and make that system obsolete. And that's what we're doing. I see, I see this happening over and over again. The whole idea is just to, to uplift ourselves heal ourselves of the wounds of being born into a hurting culture, of being born into a mentality of violence and exploitation and domination of other living beings and each other, because it goes together completely, and create alternatives. What does that mean? It means creating things like this, creating alternative communities of peace and freedom and harmony and kindness, compassion, abundance, sensitivity, respect, mercy, tenderness. This is, this is the way to do it. And this is the way we change. You know, I, it's the only way I changed. I, I was raised in a typical family back in the 1950s in Massachusetts eating the usual meals. Everybody, you know, I, I remember when I was about uh, a lot of meat, dairy, and eggs. And I remember when I was about seven years old, I said to my mother, so mom, the kind of foods we're eating, is this what everybody eats? And my mother said, yeah, this is what everybody eats. Pretty much everywhere in the world, they eat like this, yep. And then I said, okay, thanks, I was just wondering. And then she came back a few minutes later and she said, you know, that's actually not completely true. There are vegetarians. I had never heard that. It was like, I said, well, what, was, what was that, vegetarians? And then she said, oh, don't worry, you'll never meet one. <laughs> <laughs> she, said, <laughs> she, she said, I'm a lot older than you are. I never met one. And then she said, I don't know where they get their protein. And so I had this image of these poor vegetarians sort of dragging themselves through the dirt. You know, oh, help, I need some protein, help. You know, they must be half starved, you know, poor people. And so that was it. My, that was my vision of vegetarians my whole life growing up. And I remember when I was about maybe 13 years old, I went away to the summer camp in Vermont. It was this beautiful, idyllic little farm in the ups, in uh, Green Mountain, nestled in the Green Mountains of Vermont. You, you know, one of those little farms where nothing bad ever happens. It's all good. The animals are happy. Everything's happy. But I remember they taught me at one point to catch a chicken, to put her down on this board with two nails in it, hold her neck between the nails, and then with my axe, just cut her head off and then let her you know, run around with no head and then put her through the scalding tank and then eat the chickens, right? And I remember at that point, I was 13 years old and I had gone through the most intense indoctrination a human being can possibly go through, 13 years, you know, three times a day, a ritualized eating of this teaching that God gave us animals to eat, they don't have a soul, they're infinitely inferior to us, if you don't eat them, you'll definitely die within 24 hours of a protein deficiency, you know, this is the, this is the teaching, and I knew, so I knew when I cut the chicken's head off, I was doing what God wanted me to do, this is the way it's set up here, this is the way it is, you know, and uh, I couldn't quite 
question. Even a, a couple of weeks later when we gathered around a dairy cow, and this is a beautiful organic dairy, but I understand this is, this is the way it is. On any dairy, organic or not, cows, even though they would live about 25 years naturally, when they get to be about four years old, maybe five years old, they're worn out because they've been kept pregnant and lactating simultaneously, which breaks down the health of any female mammal very quickly, and so they just kill them. And then they, and one of her uh, offspring will become a slave on the dairy. The others will typically all just be killed. And so we gathered around this dairy cow. We put a gun right here. We pulled the trigger. And I remember it was shocking, really, to me just to see the quantity of urine, feces, blood, and everything just pouring in every direction from this act. But I never questioned it. It was like, well, this is what God wants. You know, this is, we're superior. We, if you can't, remember the, the, the dairy guy said, well, if you can't, we can't get milk, we got to get her for meat. You know, this is milk money or meat money. And so luckily, though, for me, and that's where this, the community comes in. I want to talk about the importance of community because the only reason I was eating animal foods and the only reason anyone eats animal foods is because of the community we're raised in, right? We're products of our communities. We just do it because th that's what our f community does. So when I left college, I remember leaving home in, in uh, New England and with my brother, we thought we'd get to California. This was 1975. And we thought if we could get to California, we would attain cosmic consciousness. So we, were, we, were, we thought we'd try to get to San Francisco, right? Oh man, I gotta get to San Francisco. Things were happening in 1975 in San Francisco. So we walked and we walked and we walked. We walked for many months. We walked probably for four or five months with nothing, with no money, just backpacking, you know, meditating, walking, you know, gave away whatever we had because we didn't want to carry it. And I, I remember it, we eventually ended up in Tennessee at the place called The Farm. And The Farm in Tennessee was started by Stephen Gaskins. He, you know, he used to do, he had his Monday night class right here in Golden Gate Park. It's so cool to be here, actually. But anyway, The Farm at that point was the largest hippie commune in the world. There was about 900 people and most of them were from California. <laughs> so they said, well, they met us in the middle. Kinda. And um, anyway, um, they, it was, and they said, we're vegetarians. So here was 900 people, they were vegetarians, and actually, they were vegans in the sense that there was no meat, no dairy, and no eggs. I mean, they just ate a totally plant-based diet, but no one heard of the word vegan in 1975, so they couldn't use it. It was an unknown word. But they said, we're vegetarians, and they had 200 children, ap approximately, that were, most of them were vegan from birth, and they were thriving. Everybody was thriving. Nobody was dragging themselves through the dirt, saying, help, I need some protein, you know. They were just doing great. You know, they had a, the book publishing company, they had all these things going on, and, and so I remember, um, I remember asking the guy, I said, so why are you guys vegetarians? And he said, well, there's two main reasons. One is, um, do you know uh, uh, that most of the, of the food we grow, most of the grain we grow, instead of feeding it to people who are hungry, we're feeding it to these animals. And they use most of it just to make manure and a bunch of pollution and people are starving and hungry people and food shortages are the, are the driving force behind war and conflict in the world. We want to create a world of peace so we're eating lower on the food chain so there's enough food for everyone. Like, God, I, could, I have a college degree. Why didn't anybody teach me about that? <laughs> you know, how, how, why didn't I know about that? So, um, so I said, that's great. And what's the other reason? And he said, well, the other reason is do you, do you know what the animals go through that people are eating? And I said, oh, don't tell me. I don't want to hear about it. But he spent a, you know, a couple of minutes just telling me a little bit about the routine mutilation, you know, cutting off the beaks and the tails and notching the ears and castrating these animals out of anesthesia and raping them on rape racks and stealing their babies and killing their babies and you know, just not how they just beat their heads against the bars, driven into insanity by the hyper-confinement. And it was, like, it was like Toto pulling the curtain back, in a sense, on, like on the Wizard of Oz. You know, it's like suddenly... I could, I, it was like, now I understand what's going on in, in this culture. It's, this is, we're not supposed to think about this. This is invisible. This is, this is the great, like the new, in the evening news every night, they don't talk about, or the New York Times doesn't say, big headline, 75 million animals we killed yesterday. You know, what happened? This is business as usual. It's routine. It's relentless. It's just, how, it's just the, the, the way we live. We don't think about it. But it's huge. It's the biggest thing we're doing by far. It has the biggest effect on the, uh, the environment, on our culture, on our health on our mentality, on everything, but we just cover it over. So it was like pulling the curtain back. I understood suddenly what was going on, and I saw this hell realm that we inflict, force all these animals into, and so that was it. That was 1975, and I've never eaten meat since that day in 1975. So that's, I don't know how, 42 years ago. Woo-hoo! <laughs> and... and um, I found out years later, actually, when I met Madeline, that this young Swiss artist in Switzerland 
Um, also, in the same month and year, 1975, the end of 1975, she also, in her life, never ate meat again either. <laughs> so we, we met each other a lot, you know, much later. But then a few years later, I became a vegan. I learned more about dairy. And then a few years after that, in uh, 1984, I went to Korea. I just want to mention this because I shaved my head. I became a Zen monk. So I was living in Korea as a Zen monk in South Korea, a temple called Sangwangsa. And I realized I was in this community, again, second time in a community, vegan community, second time in a vegan community but this time this community had been practicing veganism for like 850 years you know since the 1200s and it was no meat no dairy no eggs no wool no silk no leather no killing of insects I mean the whole thing was it was meditation I mean we would get up at uh, quarter of three every morning to start the day and meditate until nine o'clock at night you know full lotus I mean I couldn't do what she did but I mean we could sit on the full lotus anyway <laughs> and um, so we were meditating you know all that and for you know for it was a three-month silent retreat and I remember one of the things I want to share with you here this, this afternoon is just the um, being in that community with 850 years of vegan tradition just sort of in the background uh, we didn't talk about it because it was a silent, we didn't talk about anything, it was a silent retreat. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, the, but, the, but the practice, I think, you know, I'd already lived in, in meditation centers here in San Francisco, KDK, the Tibetan Center, and a bunch of other places. But I, I, um, I realized through the meditation practice, I think, really primarily, that my consciousness, as I said earlier, had been colonized by this cultural herding mentality of seeing myself as essentially separate, essentially adversarial, competitive relationship with other people, essentially separate from nature, essentially uh, superior to animals, uh, essentially uh, uh, busy and afraid underlying everything. And, um, and I realized over the, as the months went by, as my mind got quieter and quieter, that essentially my true nature, and I would say all of us, our true, uh, true nature of our mind, really in many ways it's like the sky. It's vast and it's free and it's unimpeded and it's brilliant and bright and of the nature of eternal awareness. That's our true nature. It's joy. It, we don't need anything. Essentially, we're, we are far greater, I think, in, than we realize. But I realized I'd been born into a culture where that, that sky-like nature of consciousness had been, from the time I was born, it had been dominated and covered over by an ed educational system and an economic system and a governmental system and a family system, essentially, um, where I'd been taught to, s to compete and see others as separate and, and all these, th these different types of mentalities of exploitation and violence uh, had, had insinuated themselves into my consciousness and I realized that really if I was going to make a, a difference in my own life <laughs> and in the lives of others I had to really work on myself and try to purify m my mind so that I could actually understand more clearly my true nature and I think as we do that we're naturally drawn to what veganism is pointing to which is the ancient Sanskrit word is ahimsa which means non-violence the basic teaching that as, as long as I'm harming others I'm harming myself more than I harm them I'm reducing my consciousness I'm putting myself into a fear-based relationship with the world that is only going to create misery even if I get what I want even if I'm able to dominate and exploit others others it really not only hurts them it hurts me and it and we have a whole society where we're taught to act in those ways and so I think what veganism is in many ways it's a it's a way of looking at the world and a way of living that's based on wisdom on the on the deep wisdom of our of the interconnectedness of all life that we are all interconnected that our welfare is interconnected that as we work to bring love and peace and freedom and justice and kindness to to the world that we lay the foundation of happiness and, and health and joy for ourselves and freedom and this is really what I've seen you know it's been so beautiful for me to be you know have discovered this thanks to these communities because again the only reason I was dominated and, and enslaved in a way was the community uh, of this culture but also to see these examples and so when we come together like this and we create a veg fest which is like a temporary community for a day where we're encouraging each other to question the violence in our society and the disease and the, and the blindness and we're creating an alternative right Because that's the beautiful thing about veganism it's not just a critique of a system that's violent and oppressive and destroying our, our ecosystems and so forth we have this wonderful alternative 
here it is. It's delicious. It tastes good. It doesn't cost any suffering. We can feel, you know, when you think about the beauty of this, that, you know, I can talk about, when I talk about animal agriculture, we're talking about deforestation, destruction of oceans, climate destabilization, extinction of species, you know, all this, you know, hum, war, hunger, misery, social injustice. It's like bad news. It's terrible. But the, the beautiful thing is right behind that is as we trans, as we evolve out of that and wake up, essentially it's about awakening, wake up out of that program and move our own lives to uh, veganism, to a, a way of living that's based on, on kindness and compassion for others and then share these ideas with others that we're talking about an evolution where nowadays it's understood that we can feed everyone on this earth with less land, actually. How many of you have noticed uh, how beautiful planet Earth is. Anybody noticed? You should all raise your hands on that. Let's give a cheer for planet Earth. <laughs> Woo <-hoo>! Beautiful. <laughs> you know, I mean, I have to, oh gosh, it's already time to stop. It, uh, it, planet Earth is so beautiful, and it's not only beautiful, it's abundant. This Earth is so abundant, it can easily feed everyone. We understand this. And not only, we don't have to use animal inputs. We don't have to use bone meal and blood meal and fish meal and manure. It's now understood that plant-based agriculture, stock-free agriculture, veganic agriculture, where uh, we don't feed you know, grain to animals and then use their manure. I mean, that's wasteful. We can feed everyone on much less land and we can allow the rivers to heal, the oceans to heal, the environment to heal, the climate to heal, and so forth. And we can allow our society to heal. We can allow our physical bodies to heal because we realize essentially that our physical body, all of us have been given this wonderful gift of a physical body that does not require any animal to suffer to get all the nutrients that we need to thrive and celebrate our lives on this beautiful earth. And yet all of us have been born into a culture where we've been taught from the time we're little kids to refuse that gift and throw it right back in the face of the benevolent universe and say we're going to stab and kill animals anyway. And when we do that, we create no enormous suffering for the animals, but also for ourselves. So we can, we can heal uh, our society, our, our environment, ourselves, and then finally our, our psyches, our, our minds and our spirits by understanding this and then letting go of disconnectedness, embracing connectedness, letting go of the commodification of animals and other beings and turning them into things and respecting them as beings. And then finally, the respect for the sacred feminine dimension of life. This is something I refer to in the World Peace Diet as Sophia. And I think this is, a, I'll just close with this idea. You know, Sophia was the ancient Greek goddess of wisdom. And I think what we know is that Sophia represents something within all of us. It's the, the wisdom of mothers loving and protecting their babies. And, and both men and women have this wisdom of, of caring and nurturing and protecting life. But we have to remember that animal agriculture from the very beginning was not only about killing animals, but it was about sexually violating them and abusing them. You have to impregnate the females against their will and steal the babies and kill the babies and impregnate them again. So there's this massive sexual violence against the females, against the males. You have to masturbate the males to get the sperm to put into the females in the sperm gun. You know, so this massive sexual violence and perversion against animals by the millions every day, not only sexual violence, but it's also the violence of, of stealing their babies. So it's breaking the sacred bond between the mother and the offspring. That's what our society is based on. That's the foundation of our society, unfortunately, is the breaking of the bond between the mother and the child. This is the most sacred bond. It's the foundation of a healthy everything. I, I would not be a healthy person if my mother didn't love me, right? Didn't care about me. I would not, we won't have healthy families. We won't have a healthy society. We'll have a complete hell realm if we break that bond of love uh, between the mother and, and, and the child. And yet animal agriculture is based on that. That's the core of animal agriculture is you break that bond, you steal the baby, you steal the milk, you steal their purposes, you steal everything, and then you kill them. I mean, it's the most horrible, violent, brutal system you can imagine, and yet we act like it's just normal. I mean, how can we tolerate living in a society where that's normal? How can we understand uh, at a deeper level that we can transform our society so that it reflects the natural sensitivity and love that we have actually for our children and to, and to l allow that love to actually manifest in a meaningful way. That's why going vegan is so powerful. It's saying, I'm not going to just theoretically love people. It's practical. What are we eating? What are we voting for with our dollars? So much love to you all. Thank you so much for what you're doing. Thank you. Go forth and multiply. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. And uh
Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, all right. Go, for, go forth and multiply the message. <laughs> and I'm happy to sign copies of the book in the back or at our table over here. And much love to you all. Thanks again. Yeah.